Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gail Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. George Church. Dr. Church is a geneticist, chemist, mon- molecular engineer, and professor. He is widely recognized for his contributions to genomic science, including developing the first direct genomic sequencing method, which resulted in the first genome sequence. He currently leads synthetic biology at the WIS Institute, where he oversees the directed evolution of molecules, polymers, and whole genomes to create new technologies and regenerative medicine. Dr. Church is also a professor at Harvard Medical School and MIT. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much. Great to be here. So, George, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you. And we would like to hear a bit about your background and uh, specifically, uh, what made you to become a scientist? Well, that was a long time ago. I, I had uh, very few role models. I had three f- fathers and none of them were scientists. And in fact, none of the f- friends of the family were, and we didn't even get science in school until around seventh or eighth grade. But I, I somehow my, uh, curiosity was such I had my mother bought me books, even though she was not a scientist. And I, I just became very curious about the natural world outside our door. We lived kind of in a wild area. And then my third father was a physician. I was very curious about how his medical technology worked that he would carry around with him the house calls. And then I, I think I got another big jolt of science enthusiasm when I went to the world's fair in 1964 in New York. For a floor boy, it was a culture shock in multiple ways, but I really loved the science and I just wanted to keep doing it from that point on in technology. Interesting. I assume our audience know you are uh, one of the leader in genetics and uh, nucleic acid research. So what uh, made you to decide to work on uh, genetics? Right. So I kept looking from 1964 onward, I kept looking for ways I could combine all of my interests in the natural world and in the very synthetic or technological medical world. And the first thing that, that really stuck very well, that, that really resonated was uh, crystallography of the first folded RNA, which was transfer RNA. I did that with Sung Ho Kim and as an undergraduate as a graduate student and as a technician. And I just took what I learned there and uh, went to Wally Gilbert's lab as a graduate student and uh, did scale it up, worked on more than just RNA and DNA as well. And uh, how uh, all of that work uh, made you to be uh, involved in so many uh, biotechnology companies and being uh, so influential in the next uh, generation sequencing? Yeah, so, you know, at the time that I started graduate school, it wasn't a thing to do biotechnology at all. Certainly wasn't at Duke. And uh, I was fortunate to have picked Wally Gilbert's lab about three years before he got his Nobel prize and, and about the same amount of time before he really launched Biogen as a company. I started even before Biogen, I, I was one of the first Biogen employees, but even before that I worked with BioRad developed and this is in 1978 developed automated DNA sequencing project together with their Sattler division. John West was their laser physicist there at the time, and he went on to become the director of both the ABI 3700 project and the uh, the second generation. So he he really was in charge of the big production instruments for both first and second generation automated sequencing. But anyway, Biora did not go forward with it. It brought out a related product that was based on some of what we had done, but it was very disappointing to me that they didn't actually go all the way to the automated sequence that we've been working on, but it was, you know, six to eight years ahead of its time. So I don't blame them. <laughs> and, and Selexa is actually the company that was acquired by Illumina and today is the next generation sequencing, correct? Correct. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
So, so John West played a big role in, in both of those, but that wasn't my most direct route to it. I, I also developed the, for my thesis, genomic sequencing, which is directly from the genome. And that led to multiplex sequencing, which led to most forms of, of next generation sequencing, the fluorescent ones anyway. And so I had written software that BioRad was, was thinking about, but then developing the multiplexing ideas, which we've used over and over for many things beyond sequencing, but that led to, uh, the first, uh, of the next gen sequencing genomes. So methods working well enough that there was instrumentation and genomes were the 454 and then the sequencing by ligation that was eventually marketed by ABI and, and under the name of solid sequencing. Those were the first two. We published those in back, back to back in 2005, almost back to back, same, same week with 454 in, in our paper. And, and then we, we also worked with Lynx, Selexa and Illumina kind of all merged into what is now called Illumina. So that's how you, you got involved in all the next, uh, generation sequencing domain. And I can see your finger trip all over. Well, well that, those were just the fluorescent ones. We also were in the first patent on the nanopore sequencing at, at which is now Oxford nanopore and the first patents involved in the alternative nanopore, which is not yet commercially available, but is very far advanced at, at Genia and Roche diagnostics. So there were two different ways of doing nanopore, one of which is on the market, one of which will be soon. Fascinating. And all of these, I'm assuming since my lack of PhD is showing probably led us to gene therapy, which, you know, obviously is used in treating so many things today. But for our listeners, could you, and truthfully for myself, provide an overview of what gene therapy is? Right. So it, in parallel with all that work on reading genomes, I also working on writing them. And the first real synthetic biology I was involved in was also around 1978, which was reading the, the, the first synthetic semi-synthetic plasmid, which is PBR322, which is still part of most of our commonly used vectors in, in the lab. And that was part of recombinant DNA. And then that led to synthetic biology. And one of the branches of synthetic biology are therapies. And these could be the protein therapies, which was what Biogen was about when I joined them in 1984. And it's the new version of our messenger RNA and DNA based gene therapies, which have been around uh, since the, at least the 1990s, but really didn't take off until uh, the last few years and, it's, and it are still taking off. S some of those are just replacing genes that are missing, putting in new genes or, uh, deleting or subtracting or precise editing. So, so George, can you give us some example of the uses of a uh, gene therapy today? Well, so the, I think there's two main categories the, the main approved category is for treating rare diseases where you're missing a protein typically. And for, so for example, spinal muscular atrophy or SMA is treated by a gene therapy called Solgensma. And because they're rare, it costs a lot of money to do the clinical trials. And so that that has to be amortized over a very small population. So Solgensma is about $2 million per dose making the most expensive category of drug in history at the other extreme for a category of drugs, which is very similar in the way it's delivered. So you have a single gene or a single messenger RNA or a single DNA wrapped in a viral capsid or a, a lipid nanoparticle. So you can see gene within a, some kind of delivery nano device. So another category sort of the other end of the price spectrum are, are these vaccines. So the top four coronavirus vaccines were, two of them were double-stranded DNA in a viral capsid, and two of them were messenger RNA in, in a lipid packaging. And those, some of those were as little as $2 a dose. So $2 million for a rare genetic disease and $2 for something that everybody should be taking. Interesting. And uh, recently you published a paper that showed that actually you can use a gene therapy for aging and longevity. Right. Can you describe it a bit and explain what uh, was the experiment and what uh, have you seen? So there were actually, uh, four papers that we published, all of them using gene therapy. Three of them used AAV virus, it's very small capsid. One of them used cytomegalovirus, but the, the main one that you're probably referring to was with, well, actually Noah Davidson was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab who was on three of those papers. 
One of them was with the main one where that led to Rejuvenate Bio as a company was in PNAS on using three genes in various combinations. It started with around 50 genes, 45 or 50 genes that we tested singly to see if they had effects. And these were harvested from the vast uh, literature on the subject. What we knew about aging was put to work. And we asked of all the proteins that go down uh, with age, maybe if we boosted some of those back up, they would cause reversal or, or make it easier to recover from age related diseases. And we prioritize of all the maybe say 300 genes that are evolved in aging, we prioritize the ones that looked like they were going down with aging and would spread throughout the body. So we didn't have to get efficient delivery to every single cell. We would allow a little bit of gene delivery followed by a lot of, of protein delivery. And so we, we picked out of the 45 initial genes, we picked down to three, and then we tried every single and double and triple combinations on a variety of different diseases of aging. I started out with four different diseases of, that were age related. They had very little to do with one another other than they were age related diseases. And then somebody heard about this and suggested a fifth one. And now we're, we're doing seven or eight of different diseases. But again, it's a, a good way of testing that but what you're looking at is kind of one of the core components of aging rather than just some minor symptom of aging that you're providing some kind of uh, symptom relief. We want to really get at the core of it. So, you know, that was the, the first paper of the four. And the genes that uh, you identify or you used are uh, FGF21, Clotor, and uh, TGF beta receptor, correct? Yes, except the TGF beta receptor was, was actually a soluble form. So it wasn't the nat wasn't the, what you normally think of as the membrane bound receptor. So all three of them were soluble and secreted on the outside of the cell. And then they could go locally or systemically through the bloodstream all over the place. So those, yes, those were the three clotho TGF beta receptor and an FGF 21. And, and, uh. Uh, looking at the paper, and maybe you have a, a, a new data, but I haven't seen a, any experiment that look at the effect of a lifespan with uh, that technology. Are you planning to do it? And if not, why? Right. So we, we have done a little of that, moving it very intentionally not doing that as the indication for FDA approval. It's hard to prove that a human being has lifespan expansion because uh, the variance in human lifespan is quite significant, maybe 20, 30 years. And so the clinical trial would be too long. Instead, we're, we're looking for things that are reversal of age related diseases. And we're not even calling it aging reversal. It, that's more accurate than longevity, but it's reversing individual diseases, but we're doing so many of them that if any one of them gets approved in principle, you can start using it on the other ones as well. So, and we're doing it in dogs now so that they are much longer lived than mice, which we did the initial experiments in, and they're much, much closer to, uh, to human habitat typically as well. We did do, uh, aging curves for one of the other four papers, which was using cytomegalovirus to deliver, uh, FST and TERT. So polystatin and telomerase component. And those did show very significant increases in longevity. But like I say, I don't think for any of these companies we're, we're planning on going head to head with, with FDA on, we're going we're to try to adapt to what the standard practice is at, at the FDA. And I think we'll have, we could have exactly the same impact on longevity as with, but the approval will be for aging rever reversal of specific age related diseases. That's interesting. And uh, recently we interviewed Matt Kreberlein that is also doing some uh, work on uh, dog aging. Uh, I assume that, uh, I'm sure that you know about that. Yes. Um, so, so your work is similar to his work in a way that uh, it's basically companion dogs at the home of the owner, or you do it in the lab? We're doing both. We've already progressed beyond the lab phase and we have, it's intended to be a veterinary pet product. And so we're testing it with pet owners. The intention, the company's intention is to move on to human clinical trials as soon as possible, but this will be a veterinary product initially. It, it has the advantages of the clinical trials are faster and less expensive. So their typical human clinical trial might take a decade and, and with the dogs, it's more like a year and a half. 
and you can use smaller cohorts of dogs and just overall it's, it's less expensive. It's so we can bring out a veterinary product that's affordable. Do you see similarities in the age related diseases that you're treating in humans that you're also targeting in dogs? So we're targeting the same genes and the same diseases in all three species, mice, dogs, and humans. We keep adding diseases, but basically it's the, it's the same core set. For example, we added uh, mitral valve disease, which is particularly potent in a particular breed of, of spaniel. But as far as we know, they're very homologous genes and diseases. We don't use exactly the same DNA in each case because we, there are slight differences between the mouse and the dog and the human proteins, but they're very subtle differences. We do make that change. That's incredibly interesting. And your role in the field in general spans so many different areas of focus. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about how your role really intersects biology and technology. I know you mentioned before that wasn't really a thing when you went to graduate school. So now in this role that you have, how do you really bring those two together? Right. Well, so we tend to focus, so, so there, there was some technology, but there wasn't really a biotechnology industry. You know, the kind of biotechnologies that existed back in the seventies were either, you know, manufacturing chemicals, uh, with fermentation or, uh, making artificial joints or that sort of thing where we're involved in tends to be more radical technology development, much more molecular biology. Uh, synthetic biology is basically a form of recombinant DNA and molecular biology very often. And we, by radical, I mean things, a lot of the technology we develop are kind of cut across many different application fields. So for example, reading and writing and editing DNA, those can be applied to almost any organism. Uh, they can even be applied to non-organisms, uh, occasionally. So like chemical materials or, uh, data storage and so forth. So that's very broad gene therapy is a little bit narrower, but if you consider it, that it's all about delivering the DNA that we write, then it can be broadly applied to agricultural as well as, as you know, plants, animals, and humans. And then there are various places where we will do, um, germline editing of animals with the intention of taking their organs and moving them into humans, uh, or we can do cell therapy where we use human stem cells to produce the same kind of organ like, uh, or cell therapy. So gene therapy, cell therapy is a very, you can think of it as a kind of gene therapy where instead of wrapping it with a viral particle, you're wrapping the, with a whole cell. And, Cells have certain advantages and organs have a different set of advantages. And of all of the things that you're working on right now, is there anything that you find particularly exciting or that you are super excited about? Well, yeah, I, well, I'm super excited about all of them. It's not really <laughs> answering your question. I would say that if you're given a wish and you can only have one wish, your wish should be for more wishes. And so if you're given a, a technology. What you should ask for is a technology that gives you more time to develop more technologies. And that's essentially, that's what aging reversal is. It, it might grant some of us, uh, more time to, to make more inventions that are positive consequence. And, uh, George, where do you see the future of a uh, regenerative medicine in the next, let's say five to 10 years and uh, specifically what will be the effect on the uh, aging and longevity? Well, so did you say five to seven, five to 10? I mean, the thing is five to 10 years is very short time relative to clinical trials. We have seen clinical trials can be done, not just in animals, but in humans in 12 months, like COVID vaccines. So it can be done even with radically new methods. So some of the, the COVID vaccines were, had never really been tested before at the FDA. So you can do it in a year, but typically it's 10 years. So 10 years consumes that whole cycle of, of testing. But on the other hand, 10 years is very short short period of time, sorry, it, it, 10 years is more than enough time to develop new technologies because many things are happening in parallel and they're happening exponentially. And so even if they haven't fully gotten through the FDA trials, they've at least gotten into those cl clinical trials and they're already impacting people in a positive way. So I think we will probably see within the next 10 years, almost certainly we'll see more animal organs in humans. So we've already seen a two month survival of a a human of, of a pig heart in a human, but that was not done through the full clinical trial route. We're now starting to do clinical, we've done preclinical trials and primates that look very promising, much more than two months, much more than a year. And those will 
will transition to into uh, human. Tri- they're in at least three hospitals right now, just from my groups alone. Then that's one kind of regenerative medicine. The, the other is the aging reversal gene therapies that we we're talking about earlier. There will be also a uh, reversal of age related diseases with uh, protein and small molecule drugs. I personally prefer the gene therapies to the protein and small molecules. I think and cell therapy is even better still because you get smarter and smarter, the more complicated your computer is and the, and the more complicated your drug is. So it gets to a cell cells can chemo tax, they can home in other ways. They can cross a blood brain barrier. There's just a lot of very sophisticated things that a cell can do. And you can make extremely sophisticated cells either by engineering stem cells or by engineering the germline of, of animals. And you can test them extensively in the animals that are going, the very same animals that are going to be donating the organs. So I think there's all of these things going to impact regenerative medicine over the next five to 10 years in a very big way. Interesting. Well, you are a, a fairly newcomer to the aging uh, research. So can you explain what uh, made you fascinated about the aging uh, domain? And why have you decided to join? And how do you see this field uh, growing in the last uh, few years? My first publication in this field was in 2005 uh, with mainly, I have to credit Pedro de Magalas, who's now a professor at Liverpool. When he was a postdoc in my lab, he was very obsessed with this, uh, along with another postdoc, Jong Bak, who's head of various Korean genome initiatives. Those two were quite excited about it. So in 2005, I published the first paper with Pedro, and then we, we've done many since then, including studies of extremely long-lived animals that, so that there'd be a pair of animals as long and short-lived, so naked mole rat and rodents, other rodents, bowhead whale and other cetaceans, and then long-lived people, super centenarians live over 110 years. So we did genomics and in some case, RNA analyses of these. But I think that when, when the time came to develop the gene therapies that we talked about, most of that came from sort of classical cell biology and human cells and genetics and biochemistry on model organisms. That's where the literature was that, that mostly influenced our choices so far, but they've all been fascinating exercises. And how do you see the aging field growing and the, what, uh, what do you see uh, is the future of uh, aging research? Is it more uh, um, the work that you, you're doing, like a uh, gene therapy, or is it uh, more like classic uh, genetics? Is it more uh, looking at a uh, small molecule like uh, rapamycin and, and other? So I think aging research has progressed tremendously uh, recently, along with many other fields of biology and medicine, partly because we, we're in the times of uh, where the, we're getting the payoff of the exponential improvement in reading and writing DNA and a an, number of related things that you can make, if you can read and write DNA, that you can make these other te- adjacent technologies. And that's all spilling over into aging research. And so it's come from a very kind of sketchy background, you know, where people were, it was a lot of wishful thinking and uh, hyperbole, um, where people would hope that you could just change, you know, your diet a little bit, you know, or the fountain of youth, you change your water source. And I think that was naive. I think now we have very sophisticated understanding of what's sometimes referred to as nine different pathways, major pathways. We have a lot of the molecules in those pathways well-defined. I think we may have to get all nine of them at once to really, because it's otherwise, if you fix eight of them, then the ninth one will kill you. And fixing them all at once means a combination therapy. So again, having one drug is not that going to, to do it, but combination therapy is not a, not a completely foreign thought. You know, there might be five drugs that you might use in an antiretroviral therapy, HIV. There might be three or four that you use in a, in a cancer chemotherapeutic setting, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think it's going to be combination therapy as we're going to knock out all the pathways at once. It might have to be a little, little bit personalized I and mean, it has advantages generic in that it hits multiple diseases and multiple people, but there might be some personalization that's required as well. If it's truly generic, then it will be inexpensive, just like the vaccines are. Uh, you know, I hope we get aging reversal gene therapies down to $2 a dose the way that the vaccines are. But in any case, I think we can make it something that's equitably distributed. And before we get to that point where there are these combination therapies, are there any 
decisions that you make every day related to your health, nutrition, or longevity that you would share with our listeners as maybe a tip of something that they could incorporate? Well, you know, I think most of the things that make us healthy, you know, just wellness uh, have been known for a long time, maybe centuries. You need to have uh, affection for other human beings. Uh, you need to exercise and you need to eat a balanced, diverse diet. People who go on fads where they eat one thing is probably counterproductive. People who, you know, isolate themselves from germs right now, unless they're very extreme germs, you're probably isolating yourself away from humanity as well. So those are kind of obvious and they've been around for a long time. Uh, I would like to believe that I'm doing well on those regards. <laughs> There's some newer things like metformin for diabetics and pre-diabetics has been pretty well proven for those and pot and seem quite likely for people in general. There's always a caveat that personalized medicine and pharmacogenomics, there'll be somebody who, who responds poorly to every drug, but that may be, and I'm, I'm taking that because I am pre-diabetic. But you know, anecdote, we, we should avoid temptation of going into anecdotes because it really, we need double line placebo control clinical trials. People who volunteer to do just themselves and in an unblinded way. So they actually know that they're taking the drug. I think that's, that's not the best use of their time uh, and resources. So uh, they, they should at least do a, a blinded on the, if they just could do a N of one, they can still do it blind uh, and do a crossover where they then switch over from the placebo to uh, the real thing or vice versa. I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate the plug for human affection and humanity in general. We haven't gotten that one yet though. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's, it's good, it's good to, uh, you know, either your, you know, your family or just, you know, friends, strangers, I mean, just everybody deserves a little consideration and you're, you're helping yourself by helping others. Yeah. Well, what we, uh, Josh, what we learned for Neil Barzilai, which uh, I'm sure that you know, is that with the long live humans, when they are getting older, they become nicer. So he said, if you have someone that uh, you don't like at work or at home, let him get older and he will be a bit nicer for you. So <laughs> it's similar to what you said. <laughs> well, I, I think, I'm not sure that, is that a medical study? Is that peer reviewed? I mean, you know, it's because there is the, the, the stereotypical crotchety old, you know, person. Uh, I know plenty of those. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> I think it's a uh, case by case. <laughs> yeah, de definitely. It was a joke. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it would be nice if we could do it earlier. <laughs> Maybe. No doubt. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Church. I really appreciate you yeah. being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for educating the public. Uh, this is great. Thank you so much. And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientists. For more information, please go to www.insighttracker.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.